Good afternoon, I'm Jessie Sage. I'd like to take a moment at the start of this video to let you know that I'm truly honored to be a finalist in the open call for the Pittsburgh Humanities Festival, in part because as a sex worker who will be talking about issues of sex work, feminism, and constructions of masculinity, all of which I recognize to be highly contentious, my acceptance leads me to believe that the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust has a commitment to marginalized communities as well as an interest in social justice. So thank you for taking my work seriously and for giving me a platform on which to talk about issues that I believe to be truly important and culturally relevant. But in order to get into this, I first have a confession to make, one that I have never made quite so publicly. I work as a commercial phone sex operator. I am assuming that for most of you, this conjures up images of cheesy, soft focus 1-900 ads from the 90s. Kenny G playing in the background, a scantily clad woman saying in an ear whisper, come chat with me. The reality of my job looks very different than this. And given that uh, it is now internet and not call center based, it more closely resembles internet dating, something that I assume a great number of people in the audience are intimately familiar with, particularly the younger ones. Um, or at least it resembles the beginning correspondence stages of internet dating, all of the flirtation and getting to know you that leads up to the actual dating. My colleagues and I create ads or profiles. Potential clients look through these profiles, determining which operator would best suit his needs. And clients, at least in my experience, are always men, which is important to the topic of this talk. And then they call or text us. Yes, in the 21st century version of phone sex, paid texting is a popular service. Their calls and messages are diverted to our cell phones, and we respond to them from wherever we are. Yet, there are two structural differences between what I do in my job and what I've done in my personal internet dating life, which by the way is where I met my husband, so this job actually comes fairly easily to me. The first difference is that phone sex is commercial. It is, a pay, it is paid affective and emotional labor that is, approximate, that is appropriately classified as sex work. And two, unlike dating platforms, there is no expectations of physical or in real life dating. While my clients may at times joke about wanting to meet up with me, they never expect this, and indeed, I don't believe they actually want it, and I don't want it either. It is both of these differences that I want to tackle in turn throughout this talk. Indeed, I will suggest that commercial phone sex as a type of sex work provides a counter narrative to the pervasive critique of sex work that is leveled against sex workers and against those who purchase our services. But first, let's take some time to examine a few of the common critiques of sex work. One of the most prominent critique coming out of second wave feminism is that it can be reduced to the buying and selling of bodies, of flesh, and that this crass consumption diminishes the personhood of the worker, reducing her to a mere body, to an object that can be used and then discarded. This critique is often talked about in terms of pornography, which extends to phone sex in that phone sex can rightly be understood as an auditory and verbal form of pornography. Helen Laguno says, quote, pornography requires that women be subordinate to men and mere instruments to the fulfillment of male fantasies, end quote. So on the one hand, anti-pornography feminists believe that the content of these transactions themselves are problematic in that they reduce women to mere objects or props to be used by men. But beyond the content, other feminists have argued that the fact that these exchanges are monetary transactions at all is already problematic. According to Elizabeth Anderson, quote, good sex is realized only when each partner uh, reciprocates the other's gift in kind. The commodification of sexual services destroys this kind of reciprocity, end quote. But let us take a moment to think about these critiques in relationship to phone sex. When working with clients, I offer, I offer them many things, all depending on their needs and desires. A friendly voice on a lonely night, an outlet to talk about or play out a kink that they may be embarrassed to talk to their spouse or partner about, a fantasy narrative to excite them and get them off, relationship advice, information about various sex communities, political commentary on social issues, small talk, an ear, you name it. None of my calls look the same, um, not the way that I do my job. But notice what I am not offering them, a body for consumption. In fact, my calls are only sometimes sexual in nature and because of the limits of the medium, never physically sexual. This should be rather obvious. Now don't get me wrong, I don't think that there's anything wrong with sex work that includes physical intimacy. This just isn't what I happen to do. I blame seven years of studying philosophy and theology in grad school for my comfort with purely discursive sex work. 
Um, to the issue of the transactional nature of sex work, I get paid per minute in the case of phone calls and per volley in the case of text messages. So all these transactions are monetary, in exchange of my attention for their money. But notice what is missing in my descriptions, a sense of my own objectification, or a sense that there's something problematically asymmetrical in these interactions. All of this, um, to me, raises an interesting question. What actually is it that I'm selling here? Um, it is not my body, since even representations of my body are limited to ads. Thinking back on all of my calls and text histories, it seems that I am primarily selling one thing, intimate interactions for men, a space for men to be able to share parts of themselves that they feel unable or unwilling to share outside of the bounds of sexual transactions. And since this is such a booming market, I think that we need to spend some time thinking about contemporary masculine socialization, but thinking about what it is about contemporary masculine socialization that feeds this market. Harvard researcher Niobe Way has recently come out with a book entitled Deep Secrets, Boys Friendships and the Crises of Connection, in which she argues that in, in, when which she interviews hundreds of boys and men um, and argues that boys prior to adolescence describes their friendship as extraordinarily intimate. But as boys grow into men, part of their socialization is to give this up and become stoic and independent. My sense in having so many one-on-one -on -one and highly anonymized conversations with men, and I think that the anonymity is important because it allows men to feel safe in what they're saying and expressing, is that masculine socialization has left them feeling extraordinarily lonely. Uh, my clients are married men, single men, divorced men, poly men, kinky men, men who, um, offer, who often hire escorts, or in other words, men coming from a variety of social and relationship configurations. Um, and across all of these, they express the same feeling of isolation and loneliness. So while women are socialized to have intimate connections with each other, with sexual partners, with their children, with their parents, um, Men are trained to only do this in the context of sexual relationships with women, at least in a cis heteronormative context, which is where my clients come from. In other words, in a world where men are only allowed to be vulnerable, to be open, and to be intimate with women whom they're having sex with, it's safer for them to seek out the intimacy that they desire when couched in a sexual transaction. In fact, I will argue in the more extended version of this talk that the sexual transaction, far from being the central driving force in my work, is often a cover for something deeper. Something that tells us more about masculine socialization, intimacy, and loneliness. I will also argue that the work that I do and that other women whom I work with are doing is really meaningful intimacy work that opens up space for men to express that which they usually repress. And it is always my hope that the openness they allow themselves to experience will somehow translate in fruitful ways into the relationships outside um, of the one that they share with me. But independent of what they do or do not do when we hang up the phone, what I can say is that far from the objectifying narrative that I have so often encountered, I engage in work that is creative and worthwhile, work that I hope has implications outside of any one conversation that I have. If given the opportunity, I will expand on what this kind of work looks like and means in practice. Thank you very much.